Thank you very much. Good morning. Greetings from Yale and New Haven. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me for these talks, and I'm looking forward to contributing. Disclosures as per AOS guidelines, nothing specifically relevant to the uh, hemiarthroplasty talk. Pleased to share this textbook, which was published in August 2016. The next version is forthcoming for the mid part of the year next year. I'm excited to share that we will have a chapter on hip hemiarthroplasty as well as cement uh, to include in that to expand our, our content as well as extensive chapters on revision surgery. So there's been an explosion of literature for the anterior approach. There's more and more resources. There's more and more surgeons operating, which means that there's more surgeons, so more authors, more data, better decisions that we can all take home. And ultimately, the goal for all of us is to deliver better patient outcomes on a local level to the patients that each of you take care of. That explosion of literature has allowed us to, to author that book and, and put that knowledge forward and run this course for a decade. So it, it, it's wonderful to see. So hemiarthroplasty at baseline, the surgeon must have sufficient experience for the anterior approach, get that femur released expertly. And you have to be prepared for extensile exposure of the proximal femur and the diaphysis, placement of cerclage wires above and below the lesser, and stem, uh, stem cementation. I have cement in every case available. I don't cement every case, but it's always available in the room. Establish the correct diagnosis. Of course, we're targeting uh, displaced femoral neck fractures. Get whatever x-rays and traction views that you might need. And as uh, Dr. Toller just mentioned, the diagnosis really is osteoporosis if they're a fragility fracture from a fall from a standing height. So make sure that you expose them to the appropriate workup and management from the medical side. The technical steps here, then I'll show some cases and discuss the literature. Uh, expose the hip capsule. I use an inverted T capsulotomy. I repair the limbs at the end, so I do retain those. I put a tag suture for retraction. I go down to the intertrochanteric line distally just above the vastus intermedius anteriorly on the femur. I release the medial and then the lateral capsule, and I preserve the labrum for a suction seal. So this is what that looks like sort of in cartoon or sawbones format, exposing the capsular limbs. Next, I make the basy cervical osteotomy. I take the femoral neck ring out, and I remove and size the head, of course. Uh, we inspect the calcar. Uh, if there's any fractures or fissures or fracture lines going down, we'll put a prophylactic wire. Uh, certainly, during the case, you want to maintain a direct view of that proximal femur and place a cerclage wire. So here's an example of taking the head and neck out. Next, you want to think about what I call the 270-degree capsule release. So the, the red is showing you the calcar and surrounding bone of the ring of the femoral neck. I use the same approach for head and liner exchange that I'll discuss tomorrow. So this is the release in yellow, anteriorly, medially, and laterally. And then I sometimes, well, in this case, we'll do a one o'clock release to the tip of the greater truck hander to elevate this. We'll trial the femoral ball. We'll extend, externally rotate, adduct the femur, get that inline femoral exposure, especially if you're gonna cement with a larger stem, perhaps. And so that's the movement to gain access to the femur, just as Dr. Goldberg showed earlier with his exposure. Beware of the MFCA in the back. You don't want to agitate that with a scissor. Be careful of that during your release. And that's where it's often located in the back corner of the hip. So just be aware of it. I instrument the femur. I watch out in that osteoporotic bone for perforation risk. And if I'm, if I'm cementing, sometimes now undersized by one to avoid an iatrogenic fracture, I, I sometimes will not, if the bone is really soft, I won't trial. I'll just cement in the stem that matches my templates. I'll accept a little bit of wiggle on the final stem and then cement if I don't want to break it. And I've moved towards collared stems as well as uh, press fit stems have collars now. Cementing the femur, I do use a canal restrictor. There's sets, uh, we use a, a, a disposable set that has a flexible inserter handle, very helpful for DA. I put a large lap sponge in the acetabulum to prevent any liquid cement falling behind the femur. I do the cement gun and pressurize very carefully. I go from distal to proximal and evacuate distally with a suction tube. In 2021, I do still use gentamicin at one grams per 40 gram bag with two doses usually, two bags. And we were very careful to maintain the stem version. I marked that on the neutral point uh, with a marker and we send the stem down. I retrial the head and neck at this point uh, and check leg lengths uh, easily against the contralateral side. If you're using fluoro, you can obviously check during the case as well. And of course, the final reduction is the step to follow. Post-op, uh, what you do is an inclusive aquacell dressing. Uh, they're out of bed, weight bearing is tolerated. They have no range of motion restrictions, no abductor pillow. We're currently using Lovenox injectable for five weeks, but we're gonna transition to oral drug Eliquis, and we have some data that we submitted to AOS showing equivalence in a large national sample. Fall prevention, of course, and then nutritional supplementation per guidelines. 
So just a minute with a couple simple case examples. 88-year-old who fell, very osteoporotic femur, had a stroke in the past, ambulates with a cane at baseline. You can easily template here with a ball in the film against the left hip, so that's what I would recommend. And you can see here we have a collared cemented stem, a very nice mantle, kind of a standard construct, nice leg length restoration on the pelvis post-op film. Case two, similar, uh, fell in bathroom, prior stroke, osteoporotic, hemiparetic at baseline. So this is a case that's a sort of a lower functioning patient. They're gonna get that cemented stem. We get a good view here. And this is a nice view I added to the talk, just showing the capsular limbs being reflected. I have a bipolar head here. And in order to reduce this, I tip the head backwards. I use the head pusher going down, and I have the limbs of the capsule on tension. And I go very slowly moving the leg as my assistant pushes the head in, and it mates beautifully into the acetabulum. And that's what it looks like clinically. Radiographic shows a nice restoration of leg length and offset. And this is a nice case, 95-year-old who came with a left hip fracture. And of course, 95, we all think about cement, so I did that as a primary cemented stem for hemi. Patient did beautifully until about a year later at 96, fell again. As we know, these patients who have had one fragility fracture are in the highest risk for a second. Broke the right hip. Unfortunately, I was not around at the time. Someone else took care of the patient, did a hip pinning, not, not the greatest reduction. And, and this fell apart, unfortunately. They became necrotic and shortened. And the patient, their family said, whatever you did, they don't know what I, they, I did on the left side, but whatever I did, do that to my right hip. So I took them, we templated the case here and converted them to incision approach, removed the screws laterally, exposed anteriorly, and converted them to a hemi. In this case, the bone was actually outstanding, so I just did a press fit. Patient did great. So brief, just a couple papers in the literature review. Uh, I think they're a, a more vulnerable population in elective hips. Um, and I think if it matters to have an operative approach that makes a difference, it should matter even more in this population. The guideline from the AOS in 2014 had a mention of surgical approach, and with three stars moderate recommendation of strength to say that surgical approach does matter. Already it's on the radar. The mortality risk is lower with an anterior operative approach. This is published back in 1994, comparing an anterior capsular approach to posterior approaches. And this is a great paper from 2018, which shows a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials and shows that there are no evident advantages of the posterior approach. It's routine use for the fracture-related hemiarthroplasty should be questioned. The dislocation rate was significantly higher for posterior, 2.61 odds ratio against anterior. And lastly, this more recent analysis out of China shows 901 cases. The DA dislocation odds ratio was one-fifth, 0.19, and that their population, there's no increased infection rate, periprosthetic fracture rate, operation rate, operative time, or overall complication rate. So if you're doing it, do the hip the first index case, especially now that we're in bundles, you want good outcomes. The best time is at the index surgery if you're gonna do an arthroplasty, so do it well. And as uh, one of the Peloton instructors says, your legacy is made up of a thousand small decisions. So make good decisions, use the data. The anterior surgery matters. It helps you get less muscle disruption, improved recovery, no restrictions, and shows improved dislocation risks, improved mortality risks, and I think it's a great population to start an anterior hip practice with hemis because these patients are supple, flexible, and willing to let you take care of them at a high level. So good luck. Thank you very much, and I look forward to discussion.